Well, I am just so privileged and so happy to be here to share with you this morning. It is always a joy to be drawn together in God's love and to be able to express that love to one another. I'm reminded of the um, wonderful book of, in scripture, the book of Acts, at chapter four, as we begin at verse 32. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. And so in her book entitled The Story of the Trapp Family Singers, Maria Augusta von Trapp wrote that one heart and one soul was the watchword of their family. And she gave us the Latin translation, cor unum et anima una, one heart and one soul. So this morning, uh, I'll share some, a portion of my faith journey, and then that will lead us into the story of the quarters, the title of the message today. So my faith journey began when I was born into a family who had been Methodist for generations. I was baptized as an infant in the Christian faith and a few months later, my mother received my certificate welcoming me as a baby member of what was then known as the Women's Society of Christian Service. <laughs> May I say, though, in, in addition, that many years later, as I began exploring the possibility of ordained ministry, the members of the United Methodist Women were among my strongest encouragers. I was active at many levels in, in the church growing up in all the areas, the Sunday school, children's church, choir, youth group, vacation Bible school, church camp, and very, very faithful parents who saw to it that my brother and my sister and I were involved in the church from the very beginning. And my earliest memory is singing, Where He Leads Me, I Will Follow as I stood with my grandmother in Sunday school, and I was about six years old, and we sang from an earlier version of this little Cokesbury worship hymnal, and it's the only place for years that that song was, was included. It wasn't included again until the current hymnal that we have, and I was so happy to find it again. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him all the way. And years later, I went to a Christian college. And then during my senior year, for six months, I was a director of Christian ed or a student um, uh, Sunday school uh, director and children's choir director. So it is this year, by grace, that I celebrate the 40th anniversary of being born anew in Christ. From my baptism forward, there have been many incidences of God's grace toward me and God's call on my life. But it took a long time to recognize them as being from God and to surrender myself uh, to Jesus in a trusting faith. And then after much soul searching and prayer, I asked Jesus to come into my heart and be real to me. And he did. And this experience was one of great joy and great wonder. For my ministry was entirely different because Jesus was no longer a subject matter, but a real living person. I experienced the Bible and the hymnal. I experienced every person I met and all creation and the world around me with new eyes and a new heart. And the spiritual veil was lifted. 
And so I think of the words of the psalmist as he wrote, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And from the beloved hymn, Amazing Grace, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. There are three places in the Gospel of John, I just uh, share them with you. When I heard the first uh, sentences of the first uh, chapter of John, where we read that Jesus was the Word. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God. The Word is the foundation of all things. The Word was with God and the Word was God. So many times I would only hear it as was God. Here was the emphasis on God and that just opened my eyes. Jesus was God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The second one is in John 17, where Jesus is praying for his disciples, and then he says, I pray not only for these, but also for those who will believe in me because of their word. And who is he praying for? He's praying for us. We believe because of the disciples telling the story. I pray not only for these as my disciple. He was praying for his disciples. He says, I pray not only for these, but also for those who will believe because of their word and we are his 21st century disciples. And then in John in chapter 20, it says, there are many more things that are written uh, that uh, may, might have been included in this book, but these are included so that you would believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior, is Lord and Savior. I wanted to share those with you. They were very, they're very meaningful to me. Well, when I retired from the active ministry in June of 2005, John and I were sharing our home with my mother, who loved Jesus with all her heart and could not wait till she met him face to face. She died at home in hospice care in April of 2006. Later that year, I attended the nursing assistant program offered by the American Red Cross, and um, I graduated in January of 2007, and I was licensed, and I did uh, home health care for two years, and then uh, after that, I went into the hospice department in the agency and was a chaplain for three and a half years. And so it is in that context that I share with you the story of the quarters. As a hospice chaplain, I visited homes. And uh, this lady was, was, as all my patients were, she was at her home. And she was lying in her hospital bed, and her daughters and other family members were nearby. She was still aware and able to communicate, but she was also very weak. So I asked if I would offer prayer, which they uh, did agree to, and I, so I did. I offered prayer for her and for all those who were gathered. And then she spoke of one of her daughters, to one of her daughters, um, very quietly. And um, that woman left the room and returned with her mother's purse. She whispered to her daughter again, and the woman handed her mother four quarters. Then my patient leaned over across her bed and handed the quarters to me. I thanked her with tears in my eyes in the poignancy of that sacred moment and I received those quarters with great reverence. 
But then I remembered that it was against agency policy to receive any gifts. So I quietly spoke to my patient's daughter, saying that I couldn't keep the gift. And she said, oh, yes, you can. Have you ever said that to somebody? <laughs> oh, yes, you can. You can hear it, can't you? <laughs> oh, yes, you can, she said. <laughs> well, of course, those four corridors were not really about me. She wanted me to keep them or to use them for church or charity, and I promised I was used, would use them as I was asked, and I thanked my patient again, and we had prayer, and I departed. And so it happened that that very day, I put one of the quarters in a stranger's overdue parking meter. And the three others were put in a special offering at worship the next Sunday, But the story doesn't end there. For over the years, I have always kept four quarters on hand. And they have been added to other money to be a mission gift. They've been given to someone on the street. They've been put together with, with a gift of a, of a meal for a stranger. The, the four quarters go on and on, all given with gratitude to God and remembering that precious woman who gave all she had. She gave it to me, and I, pass, I passed it on. Four quarters. So as you leave this morning, I invite each of you to receive four quarters as a gift from me. I ask that you will please receive them and will you please pray about how God would want you to bless others through your own four quarters. I received this gift of God through a gift of love from my patient and I hope that your own four quarters will help you as you continue to give God's love and your own to those you meet. To God be the glory. Amen.